I think my feet are finally warming back up. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That's like the last thing. So I'll get like fingers and toes will be cold or hands and feet. And the rest of me is fine. And then randomly, they'll be super warm. And they go back and forth. But we did that cold plunge and my feet are still like, we're getting back. The fireplace was my best friend afterward. <laughs> that's for sure. My urge to get in that sauna, I was like, oh, son of a guy. I really want it. Like, I want when it. When you got out. Yeah. Yes. I was like, mm-hmm. it, you settle into it, but I was ready to be out. Oh, yeah. yeah. I know. That's when I'm usually like, how many more seconds? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's when I just had to like bop to the biggie and like, all right, all right, we're, we're getting there. Did yeah. your back ever get warm or did you ever get any like, do you ever couldn't get, like, tell you I blacked out? <laughs> yeah, sometimes I'll get like a warm flash down my back and mm-hmm. I don't know what it is. If it's just like my, uh, that would have felt nice though. If I yeah, did get yeah, one of those, yeah, yeah maybe, mm-hmm. maybe the more you do it, the more you'll feel that. Yeah. 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 So that was our first cold plunge. Yeah. That was ever, ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Outside of like cold lake water. Yeah. Like in, like a purposeful plunge like that. Like I've had my aunt toss me in like 58, 62 degree lake water, which is cold, yeah. but it wasn't like that. I think yeah. that was, I think the temperature is 48 on that or 45. Did he say? 48. 48. I think it was 48. Yeah it, yeah. it was pretty cold. Yeah. It was cold. I was texting calm before I got here. I was like, man, I take cold showers all the time. This will be a breeze. <laughs> like this is, this is and then I, I said it like, nope, nope. This is a, a huge adjustment. I think the biggest thing for me when I first got in is I was telling you, uh, offline is the breathing aspect like it's settling and, and doing like normal breathing because yeah it's a shock at first but yeah, yeah. settled in about 30 to 45 seconds mm-hmm. that's usually what it is and then you and then you definitely feel your your breathing really start to slow down and uh, i would love to know what my heart rate you know like what, as my heart rate goes down as well yeah mm-hmm. well do you not wear your apple watch when you do it no i don't wear it Aren't they no but i yeah they probably are yeah. i don't know why i don't wear my apple watch in the sauna Hmm. so do they overheat i don't know i just let's test it out see how good their shit is yeah (laughs) yeah but that for me dunking my head under and coming back up that's when i had to catch my breath then i was good but that was like oh we're here like it's i saw you you were you were were like (sighs) yeah (laughs) it had had just get it back your nose like suck in and yeah. Well, I didn't want to like start shivering and have to get out like before my mint first minute. Like, I'm not going to allow this. Like, I'm tougher than this cold water. Well, how do you guys feel now? I feel pretty good. Good. Yeah, my my toes are still a little cold, but like I'm I'm ready for war. Let's run through some walls. Yeah. Like yeah. the gym's right down the road. Let's get after some. Yeah, I I feel like a little in my mouth. Like I feel like my mouth isn't fully like warm uh-huh. but like i feel a little shivery in my voice can you tell <laughs> in, your, like, in your mouth like like is your tongue numb or? my mouth no, is like, cold i just man. feel like my, my enunciation is i can feel the coldness still from that but mm-hmm. other than that i'm good or it's just because your jaw is tired from smiling because you had such a good time yeah, yeah. smile <laughs> yeah. right now so. yeah so when did how long have you been doing cold plunges bridget because um, you got a nice setup out there sauna yeah. cold plunge yes. you yes. got everything so the cold plunge, well, we, we uh, kind of got everything together, and I would say it was maybe six, seven months ago. Okay. Yeah, so not that long, but um, and I was telling you, it all kind of started after I read this book, Life Force, and by Tony Robbins, and David Sinclair is, is a big mention in there, and I mean, he may even co-authored it, mm-hmm. but um, just that was one of the things that I learned right away, is just this whole hot and cold therapy and just how good it is for hair, skin, um, metabolism, um, everything. And so I thought, well, that's something I can do. And so I ordered the sauna, ordered the cold plunge and just, I'm still trying to learn, you know, how do you, how do you incorporate it? And I still get anxiety before I get in the cold plunge. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. Rightfully so. Like we yeah. saw Joel do it and he's just chilling. And I'm like, he's well, just he's, having a good time in there. He's so used to it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. definitely. I'm glad he was coaching us through it. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. That helped. Um, so the last six, seven months, have you noticed, like, Tim and I feel pretty good short term, like within the last 30, 45 minutes. But over time, have you noticed some bigger changes? Well, definitely with uh, my sleep. And so mm-hmm. if I do the sauna and the cold plunge, at night and then if you are able to cool down naturally and then I, f- I feel like my sleep is amazing mm. um and then i i think that as i do it more i think just the mental toughness you know your ability to yep. handle hard things and to be able to 
leverage kind of the what you say to yourself in your head. You're just mentally being able to get through tough things. I mm-hmm. think mm-hmm. that gets stronger. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I've seen, I hate that I say this now. I've seen this video on TikTok. I hate it. But people doing it for mental health, like mm-hmm. their anxiety and, and stuff, because you can't really go anywhere else except You're, I need to breathe to through present. this. You have to be present. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's interesting um, to hear that. I said that to someone once, like, oh, cold showers, like, makes you mentally tough. They're like, oh, yeah, okay. I'm like, do you do them? And like, no. I was like, pussy. <laughs> it's yeah. like, well, if you did, it's hard. Like, Tim, you do them. You do mm-hmm. cold showers. Mm-hmm. I don't. I'm kind of a softy. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you are. that, <laughs> hey, you know. Do you do you do a cold shower? I mean, do you end your showers on on cold water I do, every yeah. day? Yeah, because it's well, I'm, I don't do a cold shower every shower. I probably do them four or five times a week. But for me, like doing a hot shower and stepping out, it's always like so cold when you step out. But when I end with cold, it's easier to get out of the shower for me. Oh, yeah. But, okay. And it, just, and it wakes me up. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Similar feeling to this, but yeah. not as like intense and, and oh yeah, feeling, when you're feeling good. See, this. this made me feel pretty tough. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm, I'm big man on campus right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you, you have a little pep in your step. Yeah, after. you know. Yeah. You definitely, you're like, hey, if I can do that, what? I mean, I can do anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's what I mean. How much we've talked in the gym. I think doing hard stuff in the gym makes hard stuff outside the gym easier. Yes. Like yeah. just you know, cold plunge lifting heavy heavy weights where you're almost a little nervous yes stepping up to that barbell it's like, that's a lot of weight like that's a good spot to be yeah like i've had coaches say when people are there that's a good spot when they're a little scared of the weight right right so i've, I've had some anxiety driving in to see you in the yeah. morning a little bit like oh what are we great. gonna do today great <laughs> least favorite thing because so for people listening that don't know uh i get to train bridget and your son his girlfriend we have yeah. a, we have a riot of a time now <laughs> i'm not do. doing all the things that <laughs> You know, but least favorite thing what that is you've had to do in the gym. Yeah, um, that I've probably put you guys through. Okay, and I, I try to be pretty like well, red line sometimes, but not all the time. Okay, but well, it's not really it's it's not like red line mm-hmm. for me. It is the damn rope climbing. Mm. I just don't enjoy it. Mm. I feel like I are you surprised by that? No, because well, we haven't like climbed well, up. Yeah, the, yeah. Okay, so let me it's like the rope that. pulls. The rope pulls. Oh yeah. yeah. So laying on your back, pulling yes. yourself up. I do not like that rope. Yeah. Because it's for me, it's just like I'm ripping up my hands, and it's just like not enjoyable. It's one of those where I just need mm-hmm. to kind of just get through it. Those are tough. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like climbing rope either, but that's why I do it. But I love like the the ab roller. I love that. Oh, I love it. Said one person ever. <laughs> oh, well, actually now it's two because Tim loves. I like it. What I like do you it. call it? Uh, oh, the ab roller. Uh, the wheel of fortune. Is what yeah. I call okay. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I just I like it. I like. And then I love the what is it? The GH. The, oh, the GHD. Yeah, GHD, we were talking about that I the like other that. day. Yeah, um, we'll start to use that a little more but now that I, I know you like that. Yeah, I just there there isn't a whole lot that I <laughs> just don't like and i think mm. you've helped me grow my confidence in just um just some of the lifts that so i, I love to hear yeah yeah, yeah. So we don't... do a lot of technical olympic things and yeah. now we're doing like toes to the bar more skill work yes. gymnastics so um all right so for people listening we have bridget boyle on the show today uh we've kind of gone through our health and fitness you know where all that started and i would like to get deeper into that but i want to also get to how we kind of got here like your roles, career, you know, uh, mindsets, all that, and then where you're at now with Roche. So wherever you want to start, if you want to go back to school or first oh, wow. job, you know, wow. how, how did how did Bridget get here? <laughs> so um, let me see. I was born in Tucson, Arizona, um, and then my family was relocated to Houston when I was 10. Um, so I ended up finishing school there, graduated, loved it, had lots of great friends, Grew up water skiing. Um, that water skiing was a huge part mm-hmm. of um, of our life, and I think that was one thing. You know, a story that helps define who I am is um, I learned how to water ski at a very young age, and I was just around it constantly. And so I was probably skiing at like I don't know six, and I remember um, being in the water, and there was this understanding that I just stayed there in the water until I got up, mm-hmm. no matter how many times it was going to take, mm-hmm. and so. That, that, again, that mental, just that grit of like, no, I'm going to figure this out. And I had two holes screwed in between or in the skis and a rope holding them together so I could keep my skis together. And, and they were these like white kitty skis with little blue fish all over them. I'll never forget. And I spent probably an entire day learning, 
you know, not giving up until I could get up and ski by myself. Yeah. Um, and then I, I went to Texas A&M my freshman year of college, just did not feel like I fit in there. Um, high school boyfriend went to a smaller liberal arts college in Durango, Colorado. And so that's where I really wanted to go. Small town Colorado. Yes. Very yeah. Small. But it was amazingly beautiful there. So I, I ended up um, following him there my sophomore year and, um, he didn't, he didn't stay there very long. Um, so he ended up moving back to Houston and I'm in Durango mm. and I just stayed there. I said, I'm here. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I fell in love with hiking and mountain biking and, um, kayaking and just everything outdoors. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And then, so you went from Colorado back to Indiana or something in between? I went from uh, Colorado. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the story when you graduate from college and your parents are still giving you a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I could make it. So I stayed in Durango another year working, but I was spending more than I was making. And so I finally got the dreaded phone call from my parents saying, <laughs> you're done, you're cut off and good <laughs> luck, or you can move home and go to grad school and work. And yeah. so that was what I did. I moved back to Houston and that's when I started uh, JP Morgan and started going to uh, graduate school for human resources mm -hmm. at night through uh, Houston Baptist University. Okay. Nice. So what drew you to HR? Well, I, when I was, let me see, I was in high school. So I think it was my senior year. I took an assessment called the Myers-Briggs assessment. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if it's still around. They still use it. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm yeah. skept skeptical about all those things. Yeah. Like they get pretty close. And then other times I'm like, ah, people put too much stock into yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I... I don't know. For me, I just needed a little bit of direction because I knew I was going to get just a business, you know, general business degree. But mm -hmm. what do you what do you do with that? And so mm -hmm. I think it was helpful to me just to say, what are my natural interests? What are my natural like, where am I drawn? And so it was very much the results of the assessment said people, um, coaching, HR, psychology, you know, those mm -hmm. types of um, industries. And so I thought, well, what the heck? I'll just start taking some of those classes. And then in my undergrad, I just noticed that when I was taking those classes, it just felt like I didn't have to study as hard because I was just so interested in it. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So, man, I wish I would have heard that before I went to, now I got my general business degree and what do I do with it? <laughs> See, And that I'm sure we may get to it, but that's, I feel like that's what kids, I, I just spoke at an event earlier this week and it's like kids that are graduating with these general business degrees are just lost. They mm -hmm. don't, they don't, it's, they don't know what to do with it. And I, yeah. so my advice is always like, go out, do internships, get as much exposure as you can job shadow people. So you can rule out the stuff you don't like mm -hmm. rule in the stuff you do like, mm -hmm. but you just, you need, you know, to have some experiences just to help guide you at least to get started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's Tim and I have talked before and we even asked, uh, when Randy Brown was on the show, like, so what are your thoughts on kids taking a gap year in between graduating high school, taking a year to see if they need college? Yeah. Like if I were to take a year in between, I might not have gone for a while just to experience some things. Like yeah. if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, yeah, you got to go to school. But what are your thoughts on kids just going to do everything they can for a year and see what kind of school they need if they need I, it? I'm not opposed to that at all. I think it really just depends on on the kid and – and where they are, you know, do they, they have to be ready and want to go to college mm -hmm. and, and be ready for that. Some just aren't, some just are a little bit lost. And so if any of my kids said, I'm just not ready, mm -hmm. then to me, it's, you know, as long as they are doing something productive with that year, right. that would be my right. requirement mm -hmm. of, again, are you working? Are you, um, you know, you have to have some money coming in, you have to have some experiences and you have to do something that's going to help you form like, okay, what do I want to do next? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good caveat. Got to be yeah. productive. Yeah. Definitely. Did you have like early in your career, whether it was while you're going through schooling or like any jobs or internships earlier in your career that really sparked something for you or like any memorable ones that you really learned early in your career? Yeah. Um, so I would say what I, what I learned is I need I need a lot of people interaction. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were my very first job. Well, I've, I've been in, in sales jobs and things like that. But mm -hmm. uh, my very first job was at a small um, ski wear company in Durango. And it was an inside sales job. And so I, I recognized right away that there were two big aspects of the job. One was kind of interacting with 
uh, customers that own different ski shops and, you know, talking to them about their needs. And I love that. And I love mm-hmm. saying, hey, have you seen this new line of fleece hats that we, you know, mm-hmm. th- that just having conversations, trying to sell, get to know people. And I was very focused on relationships. And I think that's what differentiated me. When the other half of my job was I have to file the stack of paperwork or I have to work <laughs> independently on the computer and not interact with people, yeah. it was not my jam. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's a fun gig, though. Ski, ski oh, shops. Yeah. Like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, they, so Bula was the, um, it was Bula Fiji Wear, and they were the uh, official uh, sponsor of the, I want to say the 1992 Olympics in uh, Lillehammer, uh, Norway. And so mm-hmm. they made all of the ski wear for the Olympic ski team. That's really? cool. That was really cool. So all of our owners, our founders went to the Olympics and you saw our name and our brand everywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was really cool. I couldn't imagine having your brand at the Olympic oh, Games yeah. like that. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. Like, yeah. Man, everyone why sees didn't they bring your you, stuff. Why didn't they bring well, you Well, because I was just a lowly inside sales <laughs> rep at the time. But You're helping bring money in the door. I, they, you're pretty important. <laughs> but they did uh, put me in one of their uh, winter catalogs, which was... Yeah. It's cool. So yeah. I think I think my mom probably still has it somewhere. I was about to ask if you have a copy. <laughs> yeah. I know my mom does. Frame yeah, a yeah, yeah, cool. little <laughs> wall of fame. Like, yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Like, so did you start, that's when you started learning the snow ski too? Yes. When you were yeah. out there? Yeah, because cool. uh, Purgatory, I think it's called Durango Ski Mountain now, but Purgatory was, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes away from campus, and we all had, um, you know, student passes. And that's everybody cool. knows, you know, hey, get all your classes in on these two or three days of the week, and then we can ski the other days. Yeah, mm-hmm. I went to school in the wrong spot. <laughs> <laughs> I had friends that grew up out there and like, oh, yeah, if there were snow days, we'd get Thursday, Friday off, and we'd just go to the mountain. I'm like... Yeah. Why, why would you come here? Yeah, yeah. Why, yeah. why are you here? <laughs> so you were at J.P. Morgan mm-hmm. in grad school, yep. and then what happened after that? Yeah. So then, so I was uh, getting my degree in HR uh, management, and so once I and I was in uh, just working in a branch, you know. So pretty much, I did all the roles in a in a branch back in the old days when they used to have tellers. I think now they don't even have tellers anymore. But so I did all that while I was going to school, and then once I got my graduate degree. I had this assumption in my head that, hey, I have this really fancy degree now and this amazing piece of paper. So, of course, they're going to hire me for these senior level jobs in HR. Mm -hmm. And so I start uh, applying for these jobs Mm -hmm. and and J.P. Morgan um, interviewed me downtown and they said, the only job that you are qualified for is to be an HR assistant. And I remember that was very humbling. Mm -hmm. Um, And I want to say the first you know, my first salary was like, I don't know, 27,000 a year. Oh, no, I remember, um, I remember saying when they extended the job offer, but they hadn't given me the, the salary yet. And they said, mm-hmm. we want to extend an offer as an assistant, HR assistant. And, and I said, that's, that's wonderful. Um, but I, I just need to let you know that I cannot accept anything less than 27,000 a year. And the recruiter said, Okay, well then we're gonna pay you twenty seven thousand. And what I <laughs> and what I what I like later learned is yeah. let them make the offer first, yeah, right. you know, because everything's negotiable. Yeah. But. And she, maybe it was she was gonna you know offer thirty. Who knows? Yeah, right. That's a good point. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah, so I was HR assistant, and um, I just I just put everything I could into all the jobs, and I'm you know I I would progressively move up and in, into different roles in HR, and I was at um, J.P. Morgan for, I was in Houston and Dallas, and I was there I think 14 years. Oh wow, nice. Yeah. But I, no matter what job I had, I poured my heart into it. Yeah. And um, just really tried to be the best that I could be, and um, I finally got a leadership opportunity, and they uh, moved us to Dallas, and yeah, and in between, you know, having kids, so. Yeah. yeah. Now, do you find it was easier to give everything to every job you had because you knew you were in a, a type of role that you really enjoyed? Because I think in some, for a lot of people, corporate setting, it's hard for them to give their job to being some type of analyst, giving everything yeah. to that job. But you did, you know, the Myers Briggs, found out yeah. what you liked. Do you think that helped you to be able to sink more into it because you knew it was what you wanted to do. You were with people and, and everything like that. Well, I mean, I, I think mm-hmm. that there were definitely roles that I had that I enjoyed a lot more than others. Mm-hmm. Um, and But I was very driven and wanted to, I wanted, to, I, I would, I was surrounded by these really successful women who were at the VP level and were running 
different parts of the organization. And so I, I said, I want to be that. I want to, mm-hmm. I want to do that. And so what, and I would talk to people to say, how did you get where you are? How did you get so successful? And the advice I kept getting is don't chase the next job. And you know, the next job will come to you if you can do the best job that you can in the, in the one that you have. So stay focused on where you are and be the best, do the best and always ask for feedback. And, mm-hmm. um, and I took that advice and what I found is that the jobs came, the, the promotions came, mm-hmm. but it doesn't mean that I loved every single one of those jobs. Sure. It's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I still, I, I talk to people in my current role that will come to me and say, um, you know, they're always chasing the next job. I want to be, I want to be, you know, an assistant vice president, or I want to be a VP. And then when I say, how are you doing in the role you have right now? Usually when you start to peel back that onion, you start to figure out that if there are performance issues or there are some gaps or they're not a top performer. And then I say, then you really need to focus on where you are right now. Mm -hmm. What, okay, so what about the people who maybe they're stuck in a role that is not the most exciting or maybe they're in an environment where their direct supervisor or manager, they're not that good of a leader or something like that. Any, anything that you would advise people on to like get unstuck out of a role that, that seems like there's nothing there? Like anything that you would advise people on? Yeah, I mean, I I, I always, I'm, I'm very big on really understanding yourself and so mm-hmm. understanding what your own... Um, superpowers are. Mm -hmm. And, um, so some people just say, I don't know, how would I know that? How do do I have a superpower? Do I have like a special gift? And if you think about, uh, times in your life where you've been doing something where the time just goes by so quickly Mm -hmm. and you feel like you're kind of in the flow or in Mm -hmm. the zone. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you look up and you go, wow, it's been two and a half hours. I can't believe time's gone by so fast. Those are you're typically doing something or working on something that you really enjoy that you're naturally Mm -hmm. good at. And so the more that, and then you can also, you know, go to the people that know you the best and say, Hey, what am I really good at? What do you, what do you, you know, if you know me, what, what stands out? Like, where do you think that I'm really gifted? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes others see things that you may be blind to that you don't see. So Mm -hmm. once you can really start to know yourself, then I say the more that you can, you know, spend time doing those things, the more success you will have and the happier you will be. Mm-hmm. And if you're truly stuck in a role that doesn't play to those strengths or play to those superpowers, yeah, you're probably going to feel definitely some friction. Mm-hmm. And, um, or if you, or if you work for not a good supportive leader, I mean, mm-hmm. that's why people leave jobs yeah. typically is because the leader. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would just say, if you think you're stuck, I challenge you to find, find someone to talk to, find a coach, find, Find someone that will ask you some some great questions because being stuck is like all it's all in your mind. Mm-hmm. It, you know, you just need somebody to unlock just a couple of questions and and really get you thinking that you may not be as as stuck as you really think you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, like the first priority is to master your role, do it really well. But I always tell people it's good to like obviously seek permission from your manager, but branch out and yes. like talk to people in other departments, other other aspects of the business because. There might be projects or things you could help out there, and that that could spark something within yeah. you that you didn't know you had. So. And that's that's kind of um, you know how how the world is changing. Is you know we used to we used to be in a job and that was your lane and stay in your lane. Mm-hmm. But now, I mean, you can really you can structure your job in in such different ways by saying, mm-hmm. hey, can I help on this project? Hey, mm-hmm. how do I get involved on that team? Even still staying in the same role, but mm-hmm. dedicating time and energy. Uh, to other things that you're passionate about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that was my first corporate job I had. That's why I left because my supervisor wasn't, wasn't up to par. And I think that's one thing I could have worked on better was to initiate those conversations and ask for things. I could have, yeah. I think I could have done that more. Yeah. So. Maybe you don't need to leave the organization. Yeah. You just, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah. So I, so I would say don't, don't just like, don't just leave. If you're, if you work for a good company, but you don't have a great leader or you don't love your job, it's not all or nothing. Definitely, mm-hmm. you know, right. help, you know, start to build your network, ask questions, go spend an afternoon with somebody and go, how, tell me how you do your job. How do you spend your time? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's smart to move around because you, they can do as, as good of work as they can for a role that they don't like. But if they talk to someone and they're like, oh, I like this person, they might bring you to their department yes. and, and who knows, hey, work on this with me. Let's see how you do because- right. 
you might be in the same role for three, four or five years if someone above you like, oh, I'm going for that position. But how close are they to retiring yeah. or not? Right. You might be there for a hot minute. And there is not, you know, there's not just, again, it's like we used to be in a very hierarchical career ladder where it's this mm. job, this job, this job. It is not that way anymore. I mean, it is so good to move sideways and to get different experiences, get out of, you know, try different <clears throat> industries, try. Mm -hmm. I always, you know, the, again, the, the advice I gave earlier this week um, during a panel presentation is say yes as often as you can. Mm -hmm. Just say yes. Yeah. I like that. You mentioned how like a lot of the roles in your career, like you, you did the right things, you excelled, they, they, the roles came to you. Were there ever any instances where you had to be a little more aggressive or you, you had to go out of your way to ask for what part you want? Yes. Um, I mean, definitely I, yeah, I'll, I'll share a couple stories. So, well, I was at JP Morgan and then I went to Roche. I moved to Roche in 2007 and I had to, I had to work at that. And so the reason I made that move is I was in Dallas, married. We had three kids. We were burning the candle at both ends. I mean, Dave, my ex-husband, was a VP at JP Morgan. I was, he was in IT and I was in uh, HR. And we were the first parents to drop off our kids at daycare and the mm -hmm. last parents to pick up every day. We were paying a fortune in daycare and it was just, you know, you're exhausted on, on Friday. And then you have the, the scary Sunday, you know, mm -hmm. afternoon and evening we were living that way. And so mm -hmm. we had gone to Arizona for Christmas one year. And this was like 2006, I think. And, um, I just kind of broke down and, and told my mom, I said, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't live like this. And she said, well, why don't you look for jobs in Arizona? And we're all here and we can support you. Your sister's here. And, and so I made a decision and, and Dave and I talked about it because he would have had to leave his job. And, and I said, we need the support and let's, let's try this. And so I applied for a role, um, in a completely different industry, mm. healthcare and, um, ended up getting the role, but I had to work, you know, I had to like kind of put myself out there and, yeah. um, there was, you know, I had to earn that job and I did. Mm. And, um, it was the best decision I have ever mm. made, but I was mm. scared nice. to death. Yeah. Yeah. And because when I first started at, at um, it was uh, Ventana Medical Systems, which Roche acquired um, Ventana shortly after that, it was like they were speaking a foreign language when they were mm -hmm. talking about the diagnostics tests and the instruments that they built. I did mm -hmm. not understand the majority of what they were saying in meetings for the first probably four to six months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how, how did you go about accepting that? Because I know that's tough when you kind of know everything about your job yes. at your last role. And yeah. Now you... You're at the bottom again. Yeah. You're at the bottom. You don't yeah. have an established network. Mm -hmm. You're you're really a nobody. Yeah. And you're just the new person that doesn't understand when they're talking about insight to hybridization and all the different tests. <laughs> yeah, that... it's above my paper. <laughs> <Yeah, it's laughs> <it was>. um, <laughs> Same. Yeah, but, I agree. Yeah. But it is, um, it's a humbling experience. Mm -hmm. I highly encourage everyone put themselves into a situation where, you know, where you are a rookie, where you're the newbie and you have to learn and establish yourself over again because mm -hmm. it really, it gets you tougher. It gets you better, stronger, so much, you know, so much more confidence. Mm -hmm. um, but I had to, I had to work at it mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it was scary, a mm -hmm. lot of stress in the first year of starting that role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but again, I feel like I, I, I leveraged my superpower of building relationships. Mm -hmm. And so I, although I may not have understood the science, I said, um, teach me, teach me the business and, you know, I will be your partner and help achieve whatever we need to achieve from a people and culture. Mm -hmm. you know? And so yeah. it yeah. worked out. Yeah. I and love you, what you, oh, go ahead. No, hit it. No, I was just kidding. I love what you say about the superpower too, because I talk with a lot of people who make, are making career changes yeah. and they're like, oh, like what are my transferable skills? And like being mm -hmm. able to like align on those and, and picking those things that are going to help you excel in the industry, yeah. using that to your advantage. It sounds like you did that. So, yeah. And yeah. I, but I would even take it a step further and say, you know, superpower sounds a lot more exciting. And so it's not just, you know, transferable skills, like transferable skills. Yeah. I can, I can work on a computer and mm -hmm. I, and I can, I've been on projects and I have good communication skills, but what do I love doing? I love, you know, I love creating ideas and I love mm -hmm. brainstorming and I love, I love being a connector and I love making introductions and saying, Hey, you know what? You have this need. I know a guy that can help you. Th those yeah. are the things that I love doing. <clears throat> and the more I can do that in, 
in a role, the more I love my work and it doesn't feel like work. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, yes, understand your transferable skills, but get really clear on what your, what, what makes you unique, what makes you stand out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that makes the organization stronger in itself when you can connect to other people. Cause like when, when someone helps another person that gives them the confidence that they help someone else, then that person gets the info they need and just the organization's just more interconnected because of you, because you connected them. Yeah. And then if you are a leader, if you know your teams, each, each one of their superpowers, then you get to get them working on things that play to their greatest strengths and Mm -hmm. that, you know, they'll be happier. That's right. So say someone's a little more introverted than you are. You're pretty outgoing. Uh, So someone gets comfortable with their role. They have a brand new job, new Mm -hmm. company, but they're just skittish on trying to ask for help. Just they're not as outgoing. How can they overcome that to start to build good relationships and kind of get that ball rolling? Yeah, I'm, I mean, you're right. Every, there's lots of different personality types. And um, I, would, I would say if you are more introverted, do what, what feels you know, most comfortable. I'm assuming it's probably more one-on-one interaction than you know, going to a group. But really the only way that you're going to be able to meet people and engage and build relationships is you have to put yourself out there a little bit. Yeah. And you have to say, I'm new. I'm trying to build relationships um, I'd love to, I'd love to hear, you know, about you and how did you get where you are? What, how have you been successful in this company? Mm -hmm. And I would say the more you can do that early on before you really need something, Mm -hmm. um, the better. Mm -hmm. And, and everyone loves talking about themselves. Everyone, (laughs) right? And so, so just, just use that. I mean, just say, Hey, I'd love to hear more about you. Tell me about you and how you got where you are. And then just let them, let them go and then listen, take notes and, Mm -hmm. um, Yeah. Yeah. And having like a a why for why you're reaching out to people. I think that's the first step. And I think once you have clarity on that, you'll be more comfortable in reaching out. But even if it's, I'm new to this company and I just, I've heard your name, you're well respected. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get to know you um, and learn a little bit about how you've been successful here. That's, that's a perfect reason right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of power in just telling people, Hey, I'm new. Yes. Because then it kind of breaks that wall of like, They don't have these grandiose expectations like, oh, you just got here. And there was a day when that person just got there. Yes. Everyone was new. Yeah. Everyone knew nothing at a certain point. Like they didn't come out the womb knowing. Right. Whatever that word you said earlier that (laughs) they ride over us, you know? So I think, you know, you telling people to inform, hey, I'm just new here. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of power in that and that can get you into a lot of doors. Yeah. And one thing I know about Roche um, where I'm at today is. We, we have people that care a lot. We have people that care about our patients, about our customers, about our employees, and they want nothing more than for everyone to be successful and to feel welcome. And so I can't imagine any of our employees saying, no, I don't have time for that. Mm, yeah. So. That's, that's cool to be able to say. Yeah. That you got a spot there. So is that when, when they absorbed your other company, when you yeah. kind of fell under the Roche Yeah. So headliner? I became, yeah, we were, um, we were actually, the, the, the moving van was being packed with our furniture in Dallas, and we were getting ready to get on the road to drive to Tucson. And I got a call from uh, my boss at the new company saying, hey, I don't want you to freak out or anything, but you're going you're gonna to read here in the news shortly that our company has been acquired by Roche. And Roche is a global healthcare company, the, the you know top healthcare company in the world, and their headquarters are in Basel. Pretty much after she said the word acquired, I don't know what she said after that, <laughs> because I was just you know I'm like, well, um, so the the moving van is full of all of our furniture. Yep. Are we still coming? And she said, absolutely. Yeah, we still want you. We still need you. That's cool. So that was an exciting time, um, and I was there I think two and a half years. And loved every minute of it. Um, it was, I supported the sales organization. And so I, I had to quickly get up to speed on what we did. And then um, my, my boss at the time at that company got promoted to be the CEO here in Indianapolis. Oh, and cool. so he moved here. And um, shortly after that, I would say two months after that, he called me and said, hey, there's a head of HR role open here. Um, the woman that had the role, she just moved to Switzerland and um, would you be interested in applying? And this right here is advice for um, 
women out there, you know, what I, my first reaction was, oh, I'm not qualified for that. That is way too big of a job. There is no way I could go from supporting 500 people to supporting 3,000 people. That's just too much. And he just laughed and said, well, it's too late because I've already submitted your resume. <laughs> and so he was a mentor of mine along yeah. the way. And had it not been for him saying, I'm not listening to that BS about you not being qualified. Um, yeah, it's a big jump, but you know, and we're going to stretch you and you're going to have to interview for it. But why, why would you not at least give it a shot? Mm. And had I not had, had he just said, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe next time no way would I be where I'm at and no way would I've had the experiences that I've had. And mm -hmm. so I would say women have a tendency to over index on, do I check every single box on the job description? And that's, again, that's BS. Mm -hmm. Believe in yourself and believe that, you know, if you have a third of the, of the requirements or go for it, just mm -hmm. go for it. Yeah. Men, men sometimes, you know, men, men don't. We'll take moonshots. Yes. I take moonshots yes. all the time. Yeah. I check none of these. Let's see. I think, I'm still I think, the best. I think women <laughs> need to take more moonshots yeah. and, and, and believe in themselves. Yeah. And that may be like over stereotyping. And I apologize if I've offended anyone in this, but yeah. that's just been my experience of what I've seen. People can get offended. <laughs> oh, that's good advice. Yeah. What was okay? So besides that new role head of HR, besides the more people under your responsibility, yeah. what was the biggest surprise for you when you first took that role, or anything? Any big hurdles you had to overcome in, in that role? At yeah, first? yeah. There are um, lots of big hurdles. So I I interviewed for the job, got it. I'd never even been to the state of Indiana, and, and I came to interview, and so. Again, it was, you know, the first year of starting a new job. So it's the stress of new city, me to build, you know, friends, just a infrastructure, getting the kids in school, all of that. Um, you know, my husband didn't have a job at the time. He needed to find a job. It was just all these, you know, all these things. But then what I realized is this is a big ass job. This is a big job. Mm -hmm. And I am the senior most HR person at this company. And you know, when the shit hits the fan, they're looking at me to say, what do we do? Or how are you going to handle this? Or how are you going to lead through that? And so the enormity of that feeling um, created just some doubt. You know, you, you've heard of the, um, oh, what is the, they're not, I know that it's like saboteurs in your head, but it's, what's the syndrome where you, mm. I can't, oh, I can't think of it. I know what you're talking about, you know, though, uh, where you, yeah. Imposter syndrome? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Got you. Ding, 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 Not, ding, Not just a hat rack, you guys. Not just a hat rack. Imposter syndrome. Yeah. I right. had that so bad mm. my first six months. And and I remember very vividly before um, one of our first town halls where I had to go up on stage and I was getting ready. I was in my office and our CEO, who was the, the gentleman that recommended me, came down to my office and I was just staring out my window and he's like, Hey, you ready for this? And I turned around and I said, um, I feel like I'm going to throw up. Like I literally feel like I'm going to puke. And he said, Oh, you'll have that feeling for a while, but it'll go away. <laughs> but the way that he answered me <clears throat> told me that he also had had kind of some of those feelings yeah. because mm -hmm. the job that he, you know, he was moving into at that time, he, he was a couple months ahead of me. It was a big job for him. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I felt like I heard him, you know, almost say, Hey, it's normal. You're not the only one that is going to, has gone through this or will go through this. You just gotta, you know, you gotta suck it up and mm -hmm. just take one day at a time and, and stop feeding yourself negative messages. Mm -hmm. It'll pass. Yeah. It'll yeah. pass. Was there a part of you though? I know you said you were stressed with the enormity of it. Yeah. Was there a part of you that got excited to be the go-to person? Like they're giving MJ the ball here. <laughs> yes. Like. Yeah, I mean, all of those feelings. Good reference, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the real goat. Yeah. yeah. Get offended, Don the Brown. They, uh, I mean, all the feelings were kind of wrapped up in mm -hmm. one is the excitement of it. The, um, wow, they, they believe so much in me and I can do this. I know I've got this. And then the other part of my brain is saying, when are they going to figure out? I don't know what I'm doing. And, um, you know, what if I mishandle something? But I, that's where I also learned you have to be vulnerable and you have to ask for help and mm -hmm. you have to rely on, your team and the experts around you, and you don't have to be the expert in everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I, and, and I think the team also embraced me and appreciated my authenticity and 
you know, had I come in um, acting like I had all the answers and being very directive and just this big ego, I think it would not have worked and I would have alienated people. Mm-hmm. Sure. Gotcha. But I, but the one consistent thing is they knew I cared about them. They knew I had their back mm-hmm. and they also knew that I didn't need to be the smartest person in the room. Right. Right. And I've, I've read, I forget where I was reading, but it was along those lines of never act like you're the smartest person in the room, even if you are by miles, just don't do that because someone has a, an insight or perspective yes, absolutely. that you do not have or know about. Right. Right. Yeah. So what are some, um, say you handle a lot of big issues. They ask you how you're going to take care of something. Give us some examples because I think people hear HR and they just think, Oh, you hire and fire you on board, yada, yada. But we've gotten to talk to HR people before where it is, you do big time things. Like yeah. if there's acquisitions or any mergers, like, you are in there like swimwear. So what are some um, good examples to give people like HR is a beast yeah. of a job? Well, it's, um, I mean, it's such an exciting place to be because if you just think of the last few years, how you take care of people and the culture of the company are critical. And that the companies, there are companies that thrived during the pandemic. And then there are some companies that just, you know, just went downhill fast. Mm-hmm. And it because it is all about, how do you treat people and the environment that you're creating for them? And so being in HR, it's like we're front and center that these these roles, these positions are front and center now. And it's all about talent and it's all about attracting talent. It's, it's about retaining talent, developing talent at all different levels. And so I um, now more than ever, it's and we're now relying so much more on data and analytics and insights and, you know, I was just having this really cool conversation with um, my, my current CEO, and we were just talking about how, how can we, he, he was just recently promoted, so now he's the head of our entire um, diagnostics division. And he said, you know, if our goal is to increase our talent pipeline around the world, how can we identify potential early on and, you know, potential all around the world early on? And then he referenced that movie Moneyball. And so, and I love that movie. Good movie. Great yeah, movie. such a really good movie. Good, yeah. And so the, 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 you know, how they kind of transformed how you identify talent and you mm-hmm. don't look at the normal ways of identifying talent in baseball. Is there a way that we can take some of that and start to look at data and, and um, insights of our people around the world and see what are those, um, what, what, what types of information or insights would help us help point us to potential very early on in someone's career so that we can make really big, bold bets on people and move them from country to country, mm-hmm. move them from division to division, get them really great experiences early in their career so that, you know, I think about planting trees. So we're planting trees today for the, for what we're going to need five and 10 years from now. Mm-hmm. So those kind of conversations, you know, it's, it's, it's so much more than just hiring and firing and, right. mm-hmm. and, you know, to me, that's like, yeah, okay, that's a par- that's a part of, but it's not even. It's a sliver it's of, just of a what tiny, you do. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, what are some examples of like the data points that you would look at? Like, and would it would the data be different depending on if you were looking at an internal person versus like an external person? What are some of the things that you? Yeah. Would look for well, I think um, I think internally, there's so much more that we can right. we can get right. So we would be able to get um, time and role performance ratings. Yeah. Um, is there, is there anything that we have in our, in our workday system or, or people's system online that talks about, you know, either special languages or skills Mm -hmm. or, um, and this is what I want to do is I really want to go and spend some time with some of our data scientists to say, if this is what I'm, this is what I'm trying to create, help back me up to what are some of those insights we should focus on. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we can do is, and, and these are just kind of ideas that we've been talking about is. Look at look at all of our top talent today in key positions and say, what do they have in common? Mm. What experiences do they have in common? Um, you know, is it what type of degrees do they have? Mm. Uh, yeah. Who were their leaders? Mm-hmm. What were the things that accelerated their career the most? What projects have they been involved in? Yeah. So there's there's a lot of different things that yeah. and it and it you know you can't just base it on performance ratings right yeah yeah right. and and it's also unrealistic to say hey there's an outside assessment that we can put 100,000 people through yeah so we have to be able to to look at data differently 
Yeah, that's a good point. Because performance reviews, like, they're helpful, they're insightful, but that's usually just, like, one person or, like, a handful of people yeah. making an evaluation on one person. Right, and different... if you think about uh, performance ratings, like, you know, there's a, let's say 20% of your population is at, is the top rated. Those people performed exceptionally well in their role in that year, but they may not necessarily, some of them may not necessarily have the potential to move to senior, senior level gotcha, leadership yeah. roles. So I wouldn't, I don't, I don't put all my weight in just a performance rating. Right. Yeah. Cause there's a, there's like 70 to 75% of your organization, which is rated kind of in that middle, you know, valued, which mm-hmm. some of them are rock stars. Yeah. And have tremendous potential. And maybe we just, maybe they're in a stretch role. So they're obviously not going to be hitting it out of the park if they're in a stretch role or they're growing and learning, or we just mm-hmm. put them in a different country. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. So have you started putting all that data together? Like that seems like a massive undertaking. Like well, I, where do you even start? I know you want to find similarities with yeah. people. But... This is just, these are, these are ideas and concepts that we are brainstorming. Yeah. And so the beauty of, um, of our model um, at Roche, our, our people and culture model is that we have experts in different areas around the world. And so there's, there's a gentleman that runs a data insights team in HR, or in PNC, but he's based in San Francisco. Hmm. So I want to meet with him to say, hey, I'm thinking about this. What do you think? Who else should I talk to? We have data scientists in Indianapolis who I'm, you know. So that's, again, that's what, what my strength is, connector, connecting people. Yep. And then I say, hey, can you talk to her? Mm-hmm. And, sh- and you guys come up with what you think, and then let's get a team together. Yeah. So. Then are most people, like, some might see, oh, I have another job. I got to do another task, more work. Do you get any people fight you on that. Like, Hey, this is what we're doing. You guys need to link up and work on that. Yeah. I mean, I, gosh, it would, I, I understand what you're saying because everyone is really, you know, everyone's busy, but Mm -hmm. I think if you, this is, this is again, a part of what is really important for a leader is to paint a vision of Mm -hmm. what are we working on? What are we trying to achieve and what's the impact to the organization? Mm -hmm. And so if I say, I'm going to need all of you guys to get together and you're going to have to put some data together and it's, yeah, we're going to have to crunch some numbers. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to give me some reports. That is not inspiring at all. Right. Mm-hmm. But if I say, Hey, I've, I've reached out to the four or five of you because you are well known in what you do. You're mm-hmm. the experts. And if we can, if we can do this, we may have the ability to transform the way we identify potential at Roche. And I would love nothing more than to work with you on this. Yeah. Clip I mean, that. I, I, I'm ready to work with you now. Clip no, that. Yeah, you hiring? That reminds, yeah, that reminds me of uh, Simon Sinek, who's someone I, I look up to. Yeah. Start with why. Like yeah. that's that's what yeah. that is. That's yeah. exactly what that is. Yeah. yeah. So, so powerful. That my that my best leaders that I have worked for have been really good at describing the why, mm-hmm. and it's like you know, here's the impact that you can have and what you do and how it fits to the big picture, and then most people would be all in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you also have to say, mm-hmm. what else are you working on that may have less impact? And let's kind of get that off your plate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's huge too. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up their impact because people don't want to be a number. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I'm just a cog in the wheel. Right. They know what they're doing is going to, oh, we're identifying potential. Yes. And who knows how many other companies might try to mimic that system. Like, how did you guys do what you did? Yeah. Like it could be yeah. a, you know, a trailblazing data set of data points that other companies want to mimic. Yeah. And I think that'd be cool. Like, oh. Yeah, I just think there's, um, we don't have it figured out yet. So I want to be really clear. We yeah. do not have this figured out. But I want to, again, the whole money ball concept. And I love that he, he brought that up. And now that's in my head because that was a game changer. And so, you know, how a lot of companies identify potential and, and manage talent today is they, they base it on what they know. And then, and then it's only as narrow as their kind of slice. And they say, okay, based on, on my team, this person and this person look like they have some potential. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know, put them on some succession plans. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't open it up, you know, company wide. And, and how are we capturing people from underrepresented countries and nationalities Mm -hmm. and all around the world? And how are we giving those people exposure and getting to know them? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, make something super subjective a little more objective yeah, with a touch yeah. of like and, everything's and cast gonna be... a much wider net. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because you have you might have someone somewhere in Europe that would be the best here. Exactly, and they're doing yeah. okay there, but yeah. here they have something that hey, this is where you're gonna kill it. Yeah, yeah. 
That's because, fascinating. Yeah, it is. And there's probably like a there's still probably like an untapped market like within Roche of, of people who they're capable of doing so much more, but that just hasn't been scratched the surface yes. yet. So Oh, I believe that a hundred percent. Yeah. My question for you is like what advice would you give to the mid level managers or directors or leaders who are in charge of those people to get the most out of those people? Like what advice would you give them? What advice would I give the leaders? The, the leaders yeah. to, to, to get the most out of the, the those yeah. employees on top potential. You just you, you have to know your you have to know your your team, know mm-hmm. your people, know them as yeah. individuals, and and figure out what what makes them tick. Mm-hmm. Figure out you know what their superpower is, and then you you test them and you stretch them and you and you give them a ton of exposure and you say. Hey, what are you really interested in? All right, why don't you go ask this leader if you can get involved in that project or this project? Mm-hmm. And those have been my favorite leaders when they they don't crave the spotlight. They give they you know sh- they give the spotlight to their team. They give the um, autonomy to their team. They give feedback. They give you know positive feedback, reinforcing the good, developmental feedback in the moment. Um, but just you know, and that's that is how I identify talent in leaders is tell me about your team how many people have gotten promoted Mm -hmm. where tell me about your tell me about the diversity of your team where are you Mm -hmm. hiring these people from and the leaders that have people that are drawn to want to work for them the leaders that have people that are being promoted um they are they are hiring talent they're they're developing talent and then they're moving talent up into other areas those are the leaders that i want to spend time with and those are the leaders that we want to continue to invest in Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. It's a good point. I think that's cool finding those types of leaders where you can identify who's doing what, how they're doing it, and like that's a real performance review. Yeah. Like, yeah, sure, their numbers might look good, but to your point, how are their people looking? Yeah. yeah. What are yeah. they doing yeah. and really getting done? Yes. Yeah. And how good are they at asking those open ended questions that yield those superpowers? Yes. Like, people may not even realize they have those superpowers until someone asks them that question and put them in that situation. So, yeah. yeah. In fact, I just interviewed somebody today and I was asking her, tell me about your team. Who all did you, you know, did you hire any of these uh, individuals? Where did you, how'd you find them? How do you identify talent? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, who's been promoted under your leadership? Um, so I ask all kinds of questions. You know, tell me about, Tell me about the names, like, and then I see how well do they know them? How do, mm, well do they know yeah. Bob? How well do they know Joe? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's cool. It's very telling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How have you seen? Uh, so you've been in HR for a good amount of time. How have you seen that industry evolve? Um, I think that the the biggest thing for me is, I, it's no longer just go to HR when you have an issue. Um, we are in every conversation because again it's regardless of if it's a business transformation if it's a acquisition if it's a divestiture if it's um launching a new product um you know whatever it is there are people implications Hmm. and and that's the that's the the big transformation is you know back when i started in hr in the early 90s mid 90s you know People would come to us when somebody needed to be terminated, when when there needed to be an investigation for hiring, for you know salary planning, merit planning, all of that. But it was very, it was very you know um, task focused, you know very specific. But now it's we're in every conversation, and you can have such a um, a big, you can make such a big impact in in how well you know the business and and kind of getting your team around the business priorities. So our priorities are directly linked to the business priorities. They're, Mm -hmm. they're kind of, what are we doing to help, to help achieve our goals in the business? Yeah, that's cool. If I would have found out HR was more like that back in the day, I probably would have gone, I would have leaned towards it because I'm a people person. Believe it or not, I'm a people person. (laughs) There are a lot of people that are interested in it. Um, now I, I just think, you know, Hey, PNC people and culture is on the map and it's sexy. That's and, cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool. What's um, maybe one of your biggest projects that you've had to work on uh, within your current role that oh. maybe, you know, you look down at the barbell, there's a lot of weight. I'm a little nervous about that. Yeah. Have you had one semi recently uh, project at work where I'm a little nervous about this one. I don't know how I'm going to approach it. Like that really kind of tested you a little bit more. Well, I mean, there's, um, 
I mean, I, I hate to, to the pandemic, but there were so many different things hitting in uh, that year of 2020. And so we were, we had a new CEO and um, who had just joined. And um, so he was new in his role. We were transforming the business so that the organizational, so the structure was changing. The way we were working was changing. We were trying to become more agile and, and uh, make, you know, simplify a lot of things and, and make it, you know, look at span of control in the organization and flatten it. And just really, we had, we had to make, we had to do wide scale transformation, which also meant people implications. And so, you know, the leadership team looks very different today than it did in, you know, the beginning of 2020. We had to do all of this in the middle of a pandemic, mm -hmm. all working remotely. And it was, you know, when, when I kind of wrapped my head around the, the magnitude of what we needed to do in that first year, um, it was, it was crazy how, you know, what we, and, and again, my role and my team's role was front and center of all of that, of helping to say, what should our, what should our new operating model look like? What does the, what does the business structure need to look like? What leadership roles do we need? Who, sh you know, who should be in those leadership roles? How do we communicate it? Are we, how do we retain people during all of this change? We're in the middle of a pandemic and, and the stress is already high. And now we're making these changes on top of that. So it's, it wasn't a project, but it was um, wide scale transformation. Mm -hmm. and, sure. and I don't think I've ever worked on anything that complex, that critical with all of these other mm -hmm. dynamics in yeah. play. You know, and then and then the pandemic. I mean, I'm so proud of how Roche showed up and how we took care of our employees during that. Um, part of our organization, which is our Roche support network, it is over you know, 1,400 people, and they're based all around the country. And what they do is they go and install and service the instruments that run all of the diagnostics tests around around the hospitals, laboratories, all of that. And in the middle of a pandemic, you know, the most important thing people needed to know is, you know, do I have COVID? What, you know, and then on top of all the other tests that we offer, you know, around cardiovascular, women's health, infectious disease. And so if, an, if a system or an instrument went down, that the hospital, that laboratory stops, mm -hmm. you know, at least that part of the. And so our employees were going in in the middle of a the pandemic. They are they are on the front lines calling on these hospitals, going into laboratories, making sure that, that our customers had what they needed. And so the stress on those employees was incredible and they were nonstop. You know, we had, we had people that, you know, if they couldn't fly, then they were driving to, you know, 24 seven, they were on call to make sure that all of our customers were up and running and had Jeez. what they needed. And so we were, we were creating policies kind of on the fly of how are we taking care of these people? And mm -hmm. so it was, you know, what do they need? Um, so we made sure they had all the basics of, you know, you, do you have food for your family? Do you have, you know, if you're, if you can't be home because you're constantly working, we'll, we'll get, you know, cleaning services for your home. Um, we had, you know, stipends for if people couldn't send their kids to school, they were, um, we would pay for in, in home daycare for That's them so cool. that they could continue wow. to work. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I mean, we're just, it was just one thing after another, but it was like every day I'd wake up and go, okay, what's the problem we're trying to solve today and how are we taking care of our people? Yeah. And in fact, our, um, our retention, our employee retention went up. So mm -hmm. meaning our turnover went way down. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we hardly lost anyone during those, the, during those years of the pandemic and our employee engagement scores went up. Mm -hmm. Um, we added counselors for mental health. Uh, support just for the stress. I mean, yeah, but we were just constantly going, what else do our employees need? Yeah. yeah. And I've not heard of a company take care of people to that extent, like in-home daycare, even like who, what other companies yeah. are doing that, like going that far for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool to hear. Yeah. Hang your hat on that one. Good point. Good guys. <laughs> yeah. 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 Is there anything that like the, any programs, initiatives that like is going to be at Roche to stay because of the pandemic, anything that you had put in place during that time that, um, yeah, that is going to still be there for forever now. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, um, a lot of different examples, but what the pandemic did is it, it forced, it forced us, it forced really everyone to, to have to figure things out really quickly on the fly. And so mm -hmm. just a simple example is I, in the, you know, before the pandemic, every single time we would interview candidates, 
we would fly candidates to Indianapolis. We'd have face-to-face interviews, or we'd fly them to a, a somewhere in the country so they could meet their hiring manager in person. And so there was a lot of cost, a lot of time lost, a lot of just, you know, flying people. And, and, you, and we believe we have to meet people in person in order to hire them. That's the only way we do it here. Mm-hmm. And in order to have somebody start on their first day, they have to, they have to show up with their ID and we have to prove they, they are who they are. And we have to, you know, have security meet them. And so all the things that we thought were absolutely must-haves, COVID made us have to figure out something different. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I think in that first year, we ended up hiring over 800 people in 2020 that we never even laid our eyes on. Wow. And so now all of a sudden it's like, well, it's, you know, is it best to meet somebody in person? Sure, it's best, but it's not necessary. And you yeah. can do a lot through video and a lot, you know, through Zoom, getting to know people um, in order to be able to make a hiring decision. Mm-hmm. So that was just, you know, one small example. And there are multiple examples of uh, in our business. So, for example, um, another creative idea that, that our support network came up with is we have these instruments that are huge that will run hundreds and hundreds of tests um, you know, in a, in an hour and they take a lot of time to, to put together, to install and to get up and running. And so what we, you know, somebody came up with the idea of, well, what we're going to do is we're going to put them together, put these instruments together. We're going to build them, you know, on campus, and then we're going to ship them or get that crate them and, and get them to the customer site so that they're already mostly put together. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that saved a lot of time, a lot of inconvenience for our customers. And, and so the just, you know, really, it just forced people to really think out of the box. And yeah. a lot of those things will stay with us. That's great. That's and, cool. and what the caution is, is, you know, I don't want to go, I don't want to go back to, okay, now that we're not in the middle of this, now it's more endemic rather than pandemic. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go back to the more um, complicated, hierarchical, you know, heavy process, like, let's not, let's not go back to that. Let's yeah. stay, let's stay kind of on that, that constantly thinking, how else do we improve this? How do we simplify it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Kaizen. I yeah. like that. I learned something in operations <laughs> class. There you go. Brought the <laughs> word. Good. Um, how did the progression look like for remote work? Did you guys go fully remote and then did you return to the office? Like how did that progression yeah, look? Yeah. And it's, that's all, that's a great, great question. So, uh, yes, we went fully remote if you were an office employee, mm-hmm. but we had a lot of, um, you know, first responders, like I said, who their jobs never changed. Not one day did they mm-hmm. stop doing what they were doing. And we also have a lot of, um, necessary employees, whether they be in manufacturing distribution, um, you know, that or, or call centers where they needed to be on campus every day. They didn't miss a beat. And we fed them two meals a day the entire time mm-hmm. just to say, we can't even thank you enough for you showing up every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but for everyone else that was working from home, we started communicating um, last year that, hey, it's time to come back. But we want to we want to take advantage of this hybrid schedule, because what we've learned is you know, people can do their best work depending on, you know, where they are. And so if you are primarily loaded up with video meetings, then probably the best to do that is from home. But we want you also to take advantage of the collaboration and the time together on campus. So let's have a hybrid schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, and it and for some, they were ready to come back and others were more hesitant. And I, mm-hmm. you know, what we've asked is just that leaders role model living a hybrid schedule, leaders, you know, create these anchor anchor days or anchor meetings where it makes most sense for people to be together, mm-hmm. um, whether it be for staff meetings. And so now um, I would say most people are in the office two to three days a week okay. and then working from home. So half and half. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and that seems to be working well. And our cafeterias are up and running 100 percent, you know, mm-hmm. fitness center, wellness center. We nice. have an amazing fitness center, by the way. Really? Nice. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. I'm always down for a little field trip. Yeah. yeah. I don't have to get my permission slip signed. But yeah. once, <laughs> once we, because we, we, you know, a lot of companies did the, did the stick, right? They were like, and we're going to hit you over the head with a stick, and yeah. you're going to have to go back to work, and it just, mm-hmm. just suck it up. Yeah. We said, well, let's tangle the carrot. Let's make, you know, we have a beautiful campus. Let's yeah. reopen everything, and and you know, then the draw for for people to come back, and that has seemed to work really mm. well. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. that's good. And I think having the hybrid, like for me personally, if I had to be in the office Tuesday through Thursday, 
I could work from home Monday, Friday. Yeah. I would have no problem yeah. with that. And that's that's what most people do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That and that I think is just easier to manage. Like, oh, middle of the week, nothing's happening anyway, but Friday and Monday I can be at home, don't have the Sunday scaries as much, right. you know. Yes. I can still work in the living room on yes. Monday. So yeah. yeah. That's cool having a nice balance. Plus, sure. like you you need even though people say they don't, we need that human interaction. Oh yeah. You need the water cooler talk. Yes. Like yeah. you, you need to stop in someone's office. Hey, I was you know the classic yes. just stuff. And it's just it's just fun to, you know, to like have a reason to get dressed up again. Not dressed up, but like out of your sweatpants. And yeah. look good. Just, yeah, and look yeah. good. And and I have to say, on those days that I go into the office, I feel like I just have more energy. I feel more productive. I just feel like I love having the mix of both. Mm-hmm. But I feel really good on those days. Yeah. 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 And and I agree. I need somewhere to go. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I I personally don't do well with a home gym. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. I need a, even if I just go stretch for half hour, I need to go to the gym. Mm-hmm. And Tim and I have talked about finding some office space next year too for the show where we can have this always set up. We don't have to yeah. lug it. Yeah. We can do up our walls. But having another office where – we can go do work there too because we'll go from coffee shops to, you know, I work at home a lot. But if we had a spot, yeah. my productivity would, yeah. would go up significantly. Yeah. I saw yeah. your Instagram story yesterday of you at CrossFit, Lupos, with the, the football game on your laptop. Well, I wanted working. to get a workout in, but I had bets rolling on the game. <laughs> so, you, you know, best that of was both. A good, hey, that's like a good office. That's, and then, that's multitasking. Yeah. Right I would, yeah. And they say guys can't do that. Come on. Now. <laughs> but then I would have to like pause the music and put the game on mute because then I would shoot content for like programs I'm writing. So if I had a movement mm-hmm. that I didn't record yet, I would do that. Yeah, wow. I, I was all hands Very on deck productive. yesterday. Look at you. Yeah, Look at you inspiring. Yeah. Oh. Plus, I, I like the gym quiet. We yeah. had this. Bridget yeah. and I had this yeah. conversation the other day. I don't mind. I do like class. I love mm-hmm. going to class. But some days I need to recharge. So just leave me alone. Let me crank up whatever tunes I want, and I have a blast by mm-hmm. myself. Mm-hmm. But then, yeah, I had got to keep an eye on my bets you know so <laughs> yeah. there's a night football going soon you know <laughs> of course yeah i have one more question on the uh remote thing yeah. as well yeah. uh, i'm sure you had to have had some pushback from employees right? oh. at different levels we talked yeah. about on the at the start of the podcast like starting with why yeah what was kind of the why behind bringing people back that you pushed down through the different leaders was it the collaborative aspect yeah, yeah it's the it is the the intangibles like you can't but there is something to be said for people being together, mm-hmm. you know, in a, in a meeting, the jokes, the camaraderie, the brainstorming, the, hey, let's let's get on the whiteboard, being able to look people in the eye. The other thing is, you know, so many people suffered from mental health uh, challenges during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And, and for some, the isolation was just, it just exacerbated it. And so I think as a leader, really being able to just like see your employees and just say, Hey, is every, is everyone doing okay? Like yeah. I want to be able to look you in the eye and go, are you good? And, mm-hmm. and so all of those things. So that's, that's really the why is we do great work when we can collaborate and, and be together. Right. Um, but we never, we never want to make employees feel like, Hey, we're going to go back to Monday through Friday, eight to five, mm-hmm. no flexibility, because we do know that this flex, this newfound flexibility and this newfound balance is really important. Yeah. And we probably still have some employees that are, um, that are not coming in two to three days a week. And so what we're saying to leaders is you got to lean into this. You got to, you know, I mean, the expectation is that we have a hybrid, hybrid mm-hmm. model, hybrid schedule. And so, you know, in the very worst of cases, it's the leader saying, Hey, I, I need you to come in the office a little bit more and let's talk about what maybe what your concerns are and yeah. let's talk mm-hmm. about what, what you may be missing from mm-hmm. not being here. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. And based on how you describe employees there and kind of the people you're looking for, do you guys have any fear of losing talent in terms of people not applying to Roche because they want fully remote? Is, do yeah. you guys have those conversations yeah. of losing I, out on good talent acquisition from yeah, it? Absolutely. I mean, there are some there are some companies that are 100% remote, and and there's there's pros and cons to that. The pros obviously is just you know talent anywhere can can do their job anywhere, and you can recruit from anywhere, and that's great. There is there is a downside. I mean, we have we have some employees who their job is structured that it is 100% remote, um, and 
even some of them will say, I love my job, I love Roche, but I, 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 I haven't been able to build a network as, mm. as much as I would want to, or it's really hard when every single interaction is in a, you know, a Google Meets or a Zoom. So, and, and, and how do we, are we really getting 100% the best out of, out of that person? And are they contributing as much as they could, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of brainstorming and idea generation and, and relationship building? Mm -hmm. So I think you give up, I think you give up some things in order to be 100% remote. And that's just not our philosophy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if it means that we may miss out on some talent, I think we, we see much stronger benefits from from being able to interact in person. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, that makes sense. And I just feel like you're in general gonna have more collaboration when people are more available yeah. and like when people are more available, like being yeah. physically and presently available yeah. in the office will help kind of contribute yeah, but, to that. So. But even now, so um, I mean, we, we talk about hybrid. Hybrid doesn't mean on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you have to be there by eight o'clock. It's, it's, you know, we, we're saying, you know, you're an adult, look at your, look at your calendar. So I may need to jump on a call at 7am and I'll do that from here. Mm -hmm. And then I get to the office, let's say by nine or nine 30. And you know, I don't have anybody saying, where have you been? Why you right. were supposed to be here at eight. My, you know, my, what I've asked leaders is just treat people with respect, trust that everyone is going to do the best job that they can. Everyone has good intentions and and it just, you know, focus on the output and the, the, the impact of the work that that person is doing, not the butts and seats and are mm -hmm. you here eight, nine mm -hmm. hours a day. Yeah. yeah. That's good. I like that. Yeah. Big fan. Tim, anything, I'm trying to think, anything we haven't touched or Bridget, anything that you really want to make sure we do hit that we haven't touched on yet? No, it's just, I mean, it's great great conversation yeah I, yeah, yeah. I, I mean it's just time. it's really it's like just a conversation really yeah, yeah. we because yeah. we just like learning about people like our yeah. little tagline is naturally curious yeah yeah and so we've had people comment like yeah you guys are just wondering about what we do and that's yeah. just yeah that's what we do is we, we're very fortunate of how many people we have gotten access to because we have a show mm -hmm. it's not just hey can i pick your brain for like 15 minutes no one has time for that yeah but if it's Hey, can you be on our show for 15 minutes and it turns into an hour? Right. Then we have access to tons of different types of people. Yeah. From all over the country and the world. Yeah. So And we always like to prepare like our list of questions, yeah. but we never go through them. <laughs> oh no. One no, by well, one. Because you have to yeah. it yeah. has to be organic, right? Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah, want yeah, it yeah. to be so scripted. Right, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah, I guess my, my last question uh, on my end, because I know you might have one, and then we have our mm -hmm. very last question. Yep. Uh, for you personally in your role, like how do you feel most fulfilled in your role? Is there anything that's like that you're really like looking to achieve in your role from here? Cause you've had a successful career, but like what, what drives you in your role? Like, like what is like a higher level of success look like for you? Well, I, uh, I, I also found, um, yeah, we didn't really touch on it, but, um, I'm really big on continuous learning and, mm -hmm. and being curious mm -hmm. and, um, just always learning no matter how long you've been in your job even if you think you're an expert there's always something new to learn and so I, I put myself out there with one of my work colleagues and we got certified to be coaches um, and this was right before the pandemic and it was like an 18 month certification process and that was another um, experience where I thought I was going in where I'm like I've been in I've been in HR for years you know coaching that's a piece of cake mm -hmm. I do that every day what I found is that what I have been doing for many, many years is really giving people advice, telling people what to do, or if I were you, I would do this, or I would recommend that you do these three steps. That's not coaching. You know, what coaching is, is, is you believe that, um, that the person you're speaking to, you believe that they are naturally creative, resourceful, mm -hmm. and whole, and that they have a lot of the answers that they need to either get unstuck or to move forward or to live their best life. They have those answers inside of them. They just need someone to ask some powerful questions to start to get some of that out. Yeah. And so that getting that certification and now it has really changed the way I communicate, the way I listen and the, um, the value that I can deliver to, to my leaders and my employees. So what I love is when I can spend my time coaching, whether it be mm -hmm. coaching workshops, um, group workshops on the outside, you know, we've, my colleague and I um, have done coaching workshops for other companies. Mm -hmm. We do them within Roche. Um, 
here in Indy and other locations, um, we focus on things like powerful questions mm -hmm. or different levels of listening or, you know, identifying values, um, talking about peak moments in life to identify what your values are, mm -hmm. um, all of those things. Or I'll do one on one coaching. And I just find that when somebody has that aha moment or you help to advance them past being stuck or um, a, a mindset that's not serving them anymore, I get really excited about that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. Cool. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And then and then just one other thing is because I am passionate about health and wellness and fitness, um, you know, all of my work friends know and my work colleagues know that I will always take every opportunity to talk to them about it. And so some of them probably are, are tired of me um, talking about that or asking about their health, their own health journey. But I know that I've had an impact on a lot of people in getting them on a different path towards health and wellness. And so I find that extremely rewarding. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And I it's like you're, you're worried about those things. Maybe not worried, but you're asking them about that because you care about their yes. health and well-being. Yeah. And, yeah. and they and probably some, know that. And yeah. it's, you know. And some people, some people are very, um, they, they want it. They, they, you know, they, they ask questions. They're like, tell me this, tell me that. How did you learn this? And, and then there are others like my son, who are like, okay, enough, mom, I get it. But he shows up. <laughs> he, he keeps showing up. He keeps showing <laughs> up. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, yes. we could say that you've inspired over ten thousand people based on some viral <laughs> oh, yes. reels that you have. <laughs> okay, yes. One of our one of our <laughs> videos on Instagram has gone viral, and we have like twenty five thousand. I didn't know it was views. up to that. yes to the CrossFit at the CrossFit gym. Yeah, yes. twenty. That's like twenty five thousand yeah. views and like six thousand likes. Oh, we were doing some ridiculous yeah. hack move that Bridget shows me one day. I'm like, gosh, this girl doing this. It's impressive, but she's not doing this every day. We try like it was hard, mm. but I didn't know it was at 25,000. Yeah, That's pretty cool. Yeah. We'll have to think of some another obnoxious thing to oh, do. I, I'm always on the hunt. <laughs> I, I'm, and I always send them to you. So, yeah. 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 And That's it's inspiring. Yeah. Like and it's that. like it, it was just funny because it just kind of took off and went viral. And that mm. really wasn't even the goal. I just yeah. I just love finding these crazy challenges and yeah. like, you know, going, yeah, can we, can we do this or not? Well, yeah. Joel was telling Tim about the 29092. Yes. As well. Yes. So I heard you guys are signed up for that. We are. We're signed um, up for Whistler in uh, September of next year. Did, yeah. Did, did, did he tell you what it was? Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah He's yeah. so maybe but, but, fill but, our yeah, listeners, listeners in on what that is. Okay, yeah. so 29029 um, is a an event that um, Jesse Isler is one of the founders of um, and a lot of other um, really inspirational people. But, you know, some, some of these people that are, were the founders have actually climbed Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. And Mount Everest, you know, elevation is 29,000, 29 feet elevation. And not a lot of people can can or will ever achieve that in their life. And so the goal was is to create a, a similar experience so that it is achievable from just the the common person like mm. me. And so there are different events around the country, and I think they just added Whistler um, last year. But the different mountains, so we did Snow Basin, Utah, this, this year, and that was in um, August. And what you do is we climbed Snow Basin 13 times in a row uh, over a 36-hour period, and the elevation gain and you add it up each time equals 29,029 feet. Mm. And so it was like 30 miles of hiking, 29,000 feet of elevation. And each hike was just over two hours and you ride a gondola down for 12 or 15 minutes and then you do it again and then you do it again. Oh, and it was, crazy. and then, so when we do Whistler next year, I think that hike is closer to four hours. And so you only have eight ascents, okay. but it's just a different kind of, way wow, in your mind that's great I and love it was it was by far the most physically and mentally challenging thing i've ever done in my life and and i it sounds corny to say it was life-changing but it was truly life-changing for I me bet. because nice. i i hit such and you know the way they talk about it is we we if you think about life in a, in a on a scale of like one to ten ten being peak moments the best moments of your life and one being just the lowest moments we, we all typically live our life around the four fives, you know, mm -hmm. four fives and sixes. And yeah. so that's like every day, every yeah. day you're on autopilot. But what you experience when you're on 29029 is you experience some ones and some twos and you experience some nines and tens. And mm -hmm. so the ones and twos for me were, you know, in the, in the dead of night when I have my headlamp on and somebody in front of us says, hey, watch out, there's a rattlesnake over here. And I'm feeling, <laughs> and I'm feeling nauseous <laughs> and I'm vomiting 
and I pee my pants and I just like my body just starts to shut down and my mind Mm -hmm. starts to shut down. And what I learned at that moment is I have to ask for help. Like I had to ask for help. Yeah. And so I went to um, one of the coaches and I just said, Hey, am I going to be able to finish this? Like I'm, I'm seven in and we have Mm -hmm. to do 13 and I came here to finish. I I don't think I'm going to do this. And and she's the the one, the, oh, the really the really she's attractive trying to set one. me up. <laughs> Who lives like thousands of miles away? But she's she's beautiful. Trying. She's beautiful and inspiring, and I would love for Colin to meet her. I would love that. That's a love story right there. Yeah. All right, you guys. All right, all right. Settle down. Yeah. That's great. Um, but it was like the you know dead of night, and I and I said to her, "Am I going to finish this?" And she said, "What." what do you mean? Of course you're going to finish this. You're going to take, you're going to drink some chamomile tea. You're going to take some Pepto-Bismol. You're going to eat some rice and you're going to get your ass back out on the mountain. Also, what a combination of things. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, but it was like, I had to force myself to do those things. And then, and then the group I was hiking with, it's like, they, they said the job calls for nine hikes before we take a long break and we're going to get to nine. And and at that time I, I, I had three more to do to get to nine to hike overnight. And it Mm -hmm. was, but then once I reframed it in my head, like, no, this is happening. I am doing this. I am finishing. Then once I got done and we finished the next day, midday, and I got my red hat and I walked the the red carpet, um, I felt invincible. Like I Mm -hmm. felt like there is nothing that I can't face. There is nothing so insurmountable that I can't face and get through because I'm, I now know I can ask for help. Mm-hmm. And I can, and I can start to talk differently and like, just what are the messages I'm saying in my head? Mm-hmm. And if I reframe those, I can get through anything. That's I love fantastic. That. It's so good. I think it's important for like anybody to have those type of like checkpoints and like, co- like competition in your yeah. life, like competitiveness yeah. and like something to like l- look forward to and like train for and yeah. like keep yourself engaged. I think that helps in like other areas of your oh, life yeah. for sure. Yeah. Get I mean, it, and it, and it changed. I mean, it changed me physically just mm-hmm. because of the training and everything. And I felt like I got stronger and leaner and, um, and it made me disciplined because I had to, I was, you have to train for four to five months in advance, yeah. you know? And, and if you don't, if, if you don't, you don't just show up at 29029 and just hope for the best, right? right. you know, <laughs> and, unless I, I just, I don't know. And there were mm-hmm. a lot of people that didn't finish. Mm. There were a lot of people yeah. that made it up once or mm-hmm. twice. Man. So, yeah. And. And um, there, a lot of people have said, why would, why would you sign up for that? Why would you do that? And I, I think it's like, I always say to them, when was the last time you signed up for something really hard that mm-hmm. scared the you-know-what out of you? Yeah. And, and they just kind of look at me like, I don't know. Yeah. So that, that's like, mm-hmm. you need to do that. Yeah. Got to do hard things. Yeah. 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 And by no means am I comparing these two things, but I just got in a pickleball. And I, uh, I, 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 I just, how can you compare those two yeah, things, yeah, yeah. Tim? <laughs> but, but, but I, just, I signed up for a tournament in February in like a yeah. different city. And I play like, like at the Y and like different stuff, but yeah. that's kind of outside my comfort zone. That's it's something that I that get to train for. Perfect example. And yeah, yeah it does perfect example of something that, you know, scares you a little bit and mm-hmm. it's definitely out of your comfort zone. The more of those things that you can do, mm-hmm. You're just, you know, and then you just get bigger and bigger and bigger and your confidence yeah. just keeps yeah. growing. I think yeah. Cincy does have more elevation than Indianapolis though, Tim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think technically you're yeah. going up. What What's the date on that? Uh, February 24th to 26th. Well, I'm still in town. I'll be there. All right. Let's go. Are you re- you're really going to go and watch him? Well, I'm his nutrition coach. Yeah. Uh, he, yeah I think I'm going to tap the pickleball space for nutrition. Tim gave me a brilliant idea. He goes, no one is doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I thought to my, and he, he even sent me a list of these are the top pickleball athletes. And never would I have imagined trying to get nutrition like yeah. with pickleball. And buy stock now. He, I mean, yeah. first first movers advantage. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I was like, pickleball All right, is no joke. I'll I mean, tap it, it is. Mm-hmm. It, I, I, They're crazy about yeah. it. Yeah. And it's it's such a good workout, and it's it so physical. Yeah. We can hang with my brother. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's the purpose for like all ages, all athletic types. Like yeah. anybody can just jump in and do it. It's great. I know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, so. I think about the people that created that. It's like, what what other wildly interesting game can we oh, can yeah, we come right. up with and create there's sports around the world that we probably don't even know about that are out there and people yeah. are playing well, with we had <clears throat> we had a company on called crossnet mm. and so imagine combining volleyball and foursquare yeah okay so you're still in like you have the the x with the net yeah 
but it's four square, only volleyball rules still apply. So the ball's going over the net, it can't like hit the ground. Yeah. And they're like, they told us what was, I think their first year of revenue was close to a million dollars. Wow. And years one and two, mm-hmm. they just created this, this brand new thing and we're on fire. Wow. And I never would have thought. So to your point, what else can we yeah. create? Who knows? But I'm excited to see what sport. Let's just start combining sports yes. mm-hmm. and yeah. see what happens. Exactly. Yeah. Like what can we mix badminton with? You know? <laughs> ice skates? Let's get risky yeah. oh, out here, wow. you know? Like, see, this is your superpower. I see badminton. This is the, the other. Oh, oh gosh. Well, <laughs> I know we're, we're going to go. We're in, the, we're in the gym and we were listening to crazy music. And he is so good at like. He identified like this is a combination between Bruno Mars and it was Prince. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but like he just, I don't know. I yeah. don't know what to call the superpower, but next to useless, I don't know either. But <laughs> yeah. if it could get me paid, yes. yeah, yeah. Right. If I could get paid to quote movies, I would never have to work. Yeah, anymore. you you being able to like bring a movie quote for any life situation that's also a superpower. Yeah. 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 I could. Sure. I really think I could last an entire day only talking in movie quote form. Yeah. I no real could. sentences. I, I think that'd be a good viral video to try yes. sometime. Yeah. yeah. Is yeah. only speak in movie you need quotes. To have, you need to have Tim follow you around. And, and, and still like, make sense though. Yeah. Like it <laughs> yeah. has exactly. to still yeah. add up. It has to, it has to, the context has to work. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, what do you think about this? Well, to that I say, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Or just go a whole day only doing impersonations of I do like impersonations. People. That's the other I thought this was a great episode. All the other podcasts, they suck. <laughs> Believe me, I know. It was fantastic. Uh, oh we've done an hour and a half. This is really great. Uh, but I'm a busy so guy. Funny. We talked about negotiations. I have a book, The Art of the Deal. Uh, go get it. Best best book ever for making a good deal. Oh, my God. <laughs> Half our listeners just dropped off. No, that, dude, that's fine. Because we just doubled in however many dropped off. We doubled that's in right. game. That's in right. Game. Yeah, get offended. Um, so great. I do like impersonations. Yeah. But I do have one more question before we ask like our main, like okay. our, our last one we All always right. ask everybody. But... Do you have any, could be Roche related, could be completely unrelated, any passion projects that you've thought of recently, last few years, kind of been just in the back of your mind of something else you wanted to do on the side is just the passion piece that you haven't gotten to yet? I mean, it's, I, I touched on it, but, um, and, and Joel and I have talked about it quite a bit is how do we help, how do we get serious about really helping people get their arms around health and wellness Mm -hmm. and, um, do so in a way that is, you know, we're, you know, I'm, I'm early fifties, he's mid fifties. And how do you, not based on your old blood work, (laughs) you guys in the thirties, that's right. 36 here. Um, but how, you know, people are so overwhelmed. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, I'll, I'll talk to someone and, and if they are carrying around extra weight and it's just, overwhelming to think about. So you mean I need to go to the gym and I need to start working out and I need to change the way I eat. And what do you mean? I need to be worried about my blood sugar levels and I need to, you know, Oh, and then there's this hot and cold, you know, therapy. It's just Mm -hmm. too much, Mm -hmm. too much. And so is we would love to be able to, um, have kind of a, let's just eat this elephant one bite at a time. Let's Mm -hmm. just focus on one positive change and then feel the benefits of that. And then let's move to the next step and then the next step and just make it really and do that how do you do that not just one person at a time Mm -hmm. you know yeah Yeah. um and it's it's to me it's like it's less about um how do you make money doing this because i believe that where there's a need and and people people need that and want that then naturally i think that the money will follow Mm -hmm. yeah 100 Mm percent. yeah and like there's always my think scaling how do we scale yeah but you're in a great demographic to do that too yes like yeah. people that, you know, can and want to find out those things. They'll do the blood work and, and right. you know, have the resources to do all the extras to find out because it's ever changing science. Yeah. Health and fitness in any, all the umbrellas, it's always changing. So how do we follow and keep up? But we were talking to, uh, to Joel in the sauna of, you know, looking at your blood. Yeah. And I talked to a guy recently. He's like, we're not looking at nutrition in terms of blood type. Mm-hmm. And so it got my wheels thinking, how can I approach nutrition differently yeah. and, mm-hmm. and better? And your blood is intertwined everywhere. Yeah. If you have a quote digestion issue or an organ issue, like there's blood in there. 
Yeah. So, so what's going on in your blood too that is not helping? Yeah, we just ordered. Um, we we're, we're going to probably play around with it on our trip this week, but um, there's a company out there called um, Levels, and it's a um, blood sugar monitor. And so, but it's really, you know, it's really for people who really want to understand exactly how their body responds to mm. certain foods, and you and, and trying to teach yourself how to stay within a healthy range. And so um, that's that's the next thing I want to teach myself. And so I'll be wearing a monitor for a while until I can really understand mm -hmm. what foods to to you know eat more of and what foods to avoid. Yeah. But for me, it's it's start a lot of the journey started with my blood work. And so now I get my blood. Um, I look at my blood work every quarter, and you know I try to dial in whether it be hormones or supplements, vitamins, things like that, just to make sure that I'm like optimizing everything that I should be. Mm -hmm. And even that, when I start to talk to people, even that they're like B blood work, no yeah. way. No, I'm out. I'm out. I need and, to do that. And I, I, I mean too. like that is that I just like strongly recommend is like get your baseline and, mm -hmm. and you'll be shocked because there's a lot of people out there that, f that physically look like they're healthy because maybe they, they look thin or they look lean, mm -hmm. but like Joel, he got his blood work done and it initially said he was you know pre-diabetic and mm -hmm. he was shocked yeah. because he is he's you know he he looks super fit and uh he made some uh, immediate changes in his diet and his he's completely changed his blood work mm -hmm. and now yeah. his his levels are he's just completely healthy normal range it's fantastic mm -hmm. yeah he was saying blood doesn't lie to you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so and a quote i love is you know chase health and aesthetics will follow yes and, and we modern day we we flip that yeah we chase aesthetics it's like if you try to be healthy all the things that that entails you will look good you, you just yeah. will and you know feel good yeah you know? and if you feel good then you then you look mm -hmm. then everything else like you have a glow you have a smile you perform you, better yeah 100 100 percent. so yeah it, when you guys get that started if you ever need help with anything i'd be happy to because i'll nerd out for well I always, I always say you're the you're the kind of fitness element of that so yes. yeah yeah. MJ's putting me, getting me off the bench here, Tim. <laughs> All right. Uh, so anything else before we kind of ask our final question that you want to get into, something you want to give our listeners? All right. So, so we always like to know uh, how people want to be remembered when their time here is done. Like, how do you want people to remember you? That's a great question. I, um, I just that I just want to make a difference. I want, um, I want to be a good mom. I want to be a good sister, a good partner, uh, a good friend. And I want people to just say, she, she, you know, she was, she was there for me. She had an impact on me and my life is, is fuller and richer because of my relationship with her. Love that. That's, great. I love That's it. awesome. Well, Bridget, thanks for hanging with us. We Thank appreciate you so your much. time. We know Thank it's valuable. Yeah, so it was a lot of fun. Um, I'd work for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, this was a whole lot of fun. So I know a lot of people are going to get a ton of value. Uh, listeners, thank you so much for hanging with us. And until next time, we are out of here.